Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to part two of my dissection of Amnesia the Dark Descent versus Soma. So the last thing we were discussing was one of the better ways to really take advantage of your story in games, and also how not to. Again, to reiterate, it's not like Amnesia and Soma have the best stories in video games, but I think it's fair points to make in relation to narrative connecting with the gameplay. Now we're going to get a little bit more specific here, and start talking about the story in Amnesia alone. So first, a quick summary. Daniel, the man you ultimately take control of during the events of The Dark Descent, begins his journey at Mayfair in London, England. He has a strong fear of darkness called Nyctophobia. The game begins with you awaking in a castle named Brennenburg. It is a place Daniel knew very well. The local people were terrified of Brennenburg. It was a place that men feared with good cause. It becomes apparent to Daniel very early on that he's lost his memory due to an amnesia potion that was created in the castle for other nefarious purposes. Daniel only remembers his name and where he is from originally. But as he moves forth in the castle, he remembers certain events from seeing landmarks and reading notes which reveal more of the past as time goes on. Daniel left himself a message instructing his amnesia-riddled self to find a man named Alexander and kill him. Go to the inner sanctum, find Alexander, and kill him. He hopes that you still retain memories of hatred for Alexander and it'll be enough to convince you to kill him. However, Daniel has no memory of Alexander and will have to decide it for himself as time goes on. Daniel was an archaeologist who took an expedition with a friend of his named Herbert. They visited the tomb of Tin Hanan in Algeria, Africa. Upon reaching the site, Daniel and Herbert recognized that the tomb was far older in terms of archaeology than expected. During the expedition, Daniel was trapped under a cave and had a very strange experience of potentially dreaming that he had found an orb shining with pure light, enticing him to reach out to it. The orb shattered in his hands as he grabbed it, and soon after he awoke to the Arab workers helping him out of the cave-in. Herbert told Daniel to return to England, and Daniel did so. During his time back home, he tried several times to reform the orb, but the pieces seemingly didn't connect. They continuously changed shape and texture. As a result of this, Daniel decided to make his way to a famed geologist, Sir William Smith. Herbert and his men were never found at their campsite. It was completely abandoned. One survivor, an Arab worker, claimed that someone was hunting them. Herbert's journals were sent to Daniel, and they revealed that Herbert had indeed entered the chamber himself and found another orb. Back in present time, Daniel realizes there are creatures in the castle he's awoken in. Creatures that are incredibly hostile and a shadow is hunting him. More flashbacks reveal that Alexander has been experimenting on animals in the hopes of extracting Vitae for his mystical rituals. This substance is secreted by mammals in cases of extreme stress. Alexander's discovered that the greatest method in which to extract Vitae was during almost fatal torture. He therefore had his servants perform torture on prisoners and administer the amnesia potion to them so that they wouldn't be desensitized to the experience each time. However, some victims started to remember based on visiting cells and devices they had seen previously. It is also discovered that in order to prevent the information from spreading, Alexander killed several of the men who were dispatched to collect people for his torture. Through flashbacks and notes once again, Daniel learned that he's assembled the orb in England after waking from a nightmare. He sought out a history professor named Taylor in order to learn about the history of these orbs. Soon after his visit, Daniel discovered that all of the academic minds he visited, including Taylor and Smith, were brutally murdered, for which he couldn't help blaming himself. After this, Daniel was contacted by Alexander, the Baron of Brennenburg, with a letter urging him to come to Prussia and directly to the castle itself. Once Daniel had arrived, Alexander explained to him that a shadow was hunting him, and it would kill anything it crosses paths with. It was only a matter of time before the shadow would catch up with Daniel, since despite being sluggish, it is relentless, and wherever it goes, it leaves behind a flesh residue that is harmful to touch. Daniel allowed Alexander to use his orb to potentially ward off the shadow in a ritual, one of the rituals failed, and this allowed the shadow to enter the castle. Being desperate, Daniel agreed to anything in order to save himself. In the present, however, Daniel, getting closer to reaching the inner sanctum, wherein Alexander was performing his ritual, met Agrippa. Agrippa is an old friend of Alexander's that helped him understand and harness the orb. Alexander trapped him in a husk of a body out of fear that Agrippa and Johann Vaya would abandon him in this world. Implying that Alexander wasn't exactly human or from this world at all, Agrippa asks Daniel to free him and he will assist in stopping Alexander. Daniel then reaches his last set of notes and flashbacks that reveal the truth to him. Alexander convinced Daniel that in order to protect himself from the shadow, he would have to engage in ritualistic killings of his prisoners. Daniel descended into using multiple methods of torture. At first, he killed some lawbreakers who were essentially on death row regardless. 
but as time wore on, he began killing people whether or not they were innocent, uninterested in listening to their cries for mercy. It was only much later when Alexander and Daniel cut down and captured the Zimmerman family, who lived just outside the castle, did Daniel start to realize what was happening. The little girl ended up escaping her cell, and Daniel was forced to recapture her and eventually kill her. This shook him out of his descent into madness and he realized what he had become. Daniel made Alexander the source of his anger and hatred for himself, and decided he had to kill him. However, Daniel's guilt and grief made him a wreck, unable to concentrate or properly stand. He therefore drank the amnesia potion to forget this gruesome tale and hopefully find his path to kill Alexander that way. He left himself a note on the instruction to kill Alexander and subsequent notes are scattered through the castle, likely by Daniel, but possibly by Alexander or the gatherers. Alexander captures Daniel through the use of his gatherers and requests that he allow the shadow to consume him. This leaves the player the option to enact one of the four endings in which Daniel is consumed by the shadow and Alexander reaches his home. Alternatively, Daniel releases Agrippa from his husk and pushes him through the portal before Alexander, resulting in the inner sanctum falling prey to the shadow. But Daniel being potentially spared by Vaya and Agrippa. Please, help him. I know you can. Or there's the ending in which Daniel knocks over all the stands and Alexander is consumed by the shadow, leaving Daniel to return home. Finally, you can allow Alexander to leave through the portal, and in turn Daniel is consumed by the Shadow. Regardless, the curse of the Shadow and the terror of Brennenberg are over by the conclusion of this game. Please, let me go! Okay, so what else is there? Amnesia's story is simple, a tale of revenge-fueled terror. However, being short and simple didn't mean it was unsatisfying. There are plenty of simplistic storylines that are often considered extremely entertaining to be told. It is often more important to have the story be told effectively as opposed to it being complex or extended. Though in this case, I'm almost certain the simplicity was a result of time and money restraints. I think we can all feel the story kick starting as we finish the letter from Daniel. The game itself is just filled with confusion, and I think we're really doing the player a service keeping it simple in the beginning. Basically try to take your revenge on Alexander, that is the premise of the game. You don't really need to dive any deeper than that, but hoping that the player will care about the story, they have the entire game in front of them to decide if they think killing Alexander is justified or not. The characters, despite being few, are very strong in the story. We have a very detailed experience finding out everything Daniel has done up to the point of entering the castle. But with how the game is framed, we almost get the feeling of taking over and that his past deeds are not our own. Alexander is a dominating and fear-inducing character who looms over you throughout the entire game. His history is hinted to in more distant and obscured messages, nevertheless providing a pure sense of humanity to his character, which makes you question the foundation of the game itself. Who is right, who is wrong, and what should be done about it. Many will choose to kill Alexander since he's caused the suffering of countless men, women, and children to further his attempts to go home. While some people will feel even Daniel needs to be killed for the actions in the game. Alexander, I will kill you for what you have done. How about yourself? The story is delivered for the most part by notes. Notes that detail particular events in Daniel's life, Alexander's life, and certain other tertiary characters. This will be an opportunity to talk about the pacing of the story in the game. The pacing of everything in the game is practically perfect. Everything being delivered at a constant drip pace, allowing the players to absorb what happened and how it's slowly fitting into here and now. How Daniel went from being the mild-mannered archaeologist looking to make an impressive find, to becoming a selfish, morality-deprived psychopath. There's never more than three parts to a note selection in any of the area, and all of them usually contain a story from start to finish about a section of Daniel's life. These notes will explicitly explain what happened, and even if you miss a majority of them, Frictional will ensure that you understand the ramifications of Daniel's actions, and why he began at the castle floor. As long as you're willing to pick them up, and sometimes as long as you're willing to listen. So I'm gonna skip these if you want to read them. Story. Story. I'm gonna scan through right. passage. 
confused. I'm trying to see if there's anything that's actually useful in any of these things. Hello? Okay, it's about getting the brain to do the right thing. Okay, cool. There sure is a lot of stuff about the brain over here. I can't believe someone stole your journal just to throw it around in random places across the entire map. The story will have the player guessing the ending as it's set up to be a sort of twist ending, so most players will be trying to absorb the information to find the potential twist. Okay, I'm just calling this right here. Daniel and Alexander are the same person. Yeah, that's it. The interesting thing is that if you pay attention to flashbacks and diary entries, you'll understand more about the world you're in and therefore improve your abilities within it. Information in the story being told represents very real places and objects in the world. Oh, I should just be following these pipes. Because that's what, this, what carries the sound of the torture to all of the other uh, inmates. Christopher Rod manages to find what is essentially the only guide to this very blinding and large area that was essentially intended to be a place where you get completely lost. Thanks to him paying attention to how the pipe system was used in the flashbacks and the diary entries, he was able to use this to his advantage. The inspiration for this level came from the first Silent Hill game, when you run around in the town. I wanted to recreate the feeling of being lost, knowing that dangerous creatures lurked in the fog. I did not really like the map in the Silent Hill games though, as you always had to switch back and forth between it. So in all our games we tried to come up with other ways to help the player navigate. In this level, it meant that you should follow the pipes. This is the kind of thing I love about Frictional, they take inspiration and try and tweak it to make it better, from their perspective, obviously. Silent Hill's opening makes you feel lost and trapped all at the same time, you move through it not knowing what you might be walking into, and every time you hit a dead end you feel even more distraught. I felt very similar in the choir hall, and I didn't even click about the pipes in my first playthrough, so it made it much worse. It's arguably a very simple reward for paying attention, which Amnesia is littered with. Amnesia the Dark Descent also has a three-pronged method of taking advantage of its namesake. As you move forward in this game, you get lower and lower, moving through darker and darker areas. As you do, you find notes pertaining to moments in Daniel's life that are getting more and more awful as time goes on. Finally, the things you have to do become harder, more taxing, and more gruesome the further you get into the game. This was no accident, and it adds to making the entire experience feel like a complete package, with every moving part culminating to one solid emotional roller coaster. This comes back to what I was talking about with pacing. If we were to split amnesia into points of intensity and a break, then the game almost starts with a lot more of breaks than it does intensity. As you progress, though, there are far less breaks until we culminate into a series of torture chambers, an ominously threatening final room involving blood, sacrifice, chase sequences, and monsters, ending with you meeting Alexander face to face. In terms of delivery, Amnesia makes sure to paste the flashbacks and notes in areas that are outside of enemy encounters so as to not ruin the sense of immersion. If a player is being attacked while reading, it's going to be horrendous. This is obvious, and it splits the game into two sort of separate operations, one being monster mode and the other being a non-monster mode, but the only way this can really ruin the experience is if you recognize it fast. And most people won't be able to until they've completed the game, or at least gotten to a certain significant moment further into the story. However, there are times when you can actually activate a flashback and have an enemy in the sequence, and then something like this happens. It's too dangerous! I doubt that very much. So yeah, it really bugs me when people say that they just know when it's in monster mode or not. Like they hear a monster scream and feel like it's a telltale sign of being in active mode. That's literally the intention, but yeah, we'll get to that. So there's an elephant in the room, and that is the storytelling nature of using amnesia to break up the plot points and cover the thematic reasons for a player not knowing what's happening. Does it work? Is it cheap? Well, since there are thematic reasons for the potion to exist and why Daniel took it, I don't personally have a problem with it, but some people do. It should really be called short-term memory loss, the Dark Descent, because before too long the timeline gets filled in through diary journals and frequent flashbacks triggered as you explore the environment. See, I don't even really get this argument. By the end of the game, instead of remembering nothing, you remember that your name is Daniel, that you don't like a guy called Alexander, that you know a few things about some characters that you read about, the few flashbacks you get are really only about your navigation through the castle, and you barely remember about where you even came from. Honestly, by the end of the game, you really don't know much at all. That's certainly an area where Daniel may have fucked up. Dude doesn't remember shit now. How is he going to be a productive member of society? So yeah, you get people with snide comments about the system in place, like the idea that he's forgetting everything just to set up the fact that he'll know everything soon. But it works just fine, especially when you start to look really deep into it. 
Daniel doesn't remember much of anything by the end of the game, aside from the goal he had and enough to keep him surviving. Something that's really cool about this game that many aren't even aware of is that you're given loading screen messages about Daniel's history and his sister Hazel. Depending on how much the player engages in selfless acts, the story will change. If you show no compassion for people in need, then historically Hazel will die. One of my favorite additions to the game was the loading screens, how they was able to mirror and foreshadow the action of the player. Of course, there might not be that many who actually pay attention to these little snippets of text, but there were some really good stuff in there. There is even one character's life you can influence through the game, which is only mentioned in the loading text, which is Hazel, Daniel's sister, which will either live or have died when she was young depending on what the player chooses to do in the game. The actions don't correlate, of course, but it is supposed to show that the way the player acts is a part of Daniel's real inescapable behavior. If the player plays Daniel in a caring way, uh, he will have saved his sister from her death when they were younger. And if the player shows no will to help others, she will have died. There are many interesting facts about the story with Amnesia, such as the most important moment in Daniel's character history, killing the Zimmerman girl being something that arrived almost by accident. At first, the hunted girl sequence was just another scare. But as the story took shape, it just became a great plot point, which was, this is when Daniel snapped. He does all these weird and evil things, but he, he tells himself the ends justify the means. And, but when he finally kills the girl, he just can't make up excuses anymore, so he goes mad, and as a final attempt of saving himself, he drinks the amnesia potion. Of course, the player won't realize this as he encounters this first sequence, but it becomes clear when he finds the last diary pages explaining the situation, making it all come full circle. This kind of living development where things are thrown together and turn out brilliantly because of the intention behind them is why Frictional remind me of someone like Joss Whedon. He's like one of my favorite writer-directors, but, but more to the point, one of his most iconic characters from Buffy was just thrown in as a potential bad guy to try and pad out the second season of the show, and the performance went so well that they scrapped the villain they actually had and were trying to develop, and brought Spike on for full time. I'm bad! You made a bad! I didn't mean to. Undo it! Undo it! This kind of thing doesn't happen that often in projects that are planned from beginning to end before production even begins. Despite that sounding kind of ridiculous in terms of a design philosophy, it doesn't mean that the show ends up being perfect, nor does it mean that for the game. There are plenty of things to criticize, and a lot of the time it's going to be because of this design philosophy. Like, I'm not going to criticize something for being planned out. I'm not. I just think there's a lot of value in improvisation. And that represents frictional in design a lot, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. You never know when the creative spark is really going to hit you. But anyway, something I'll try and prove while looking into different aspects of this game is that Frictional marry the story with the atmosphere and the gameplay. They reflect and complement each other regularly. For example, during the storyline you start to uncover decisions and actions that Daniel takes to alleviate his situation. These occur during sequences that involve the player having to turn valves in an area that convince you that what you're doing is making everything worse. This map is all about themes and the action the player does are meant to reflect what happens in the diary entries. The player needs to turn the vaults in order to progress, but at the same time, things go bad every time this is done. The level gets darker, the sound of someone being trapped gets louder, and the water lurker seems to be coming closer. Everything tells the player not to turn the vaults, yet it must be done. Something that reflects how Daniel feels in the diaries. When you reach Daniel's room in Bredenburg Castle, you find notes that talk about Daniel's home in London. It's a brightly lit room with plenty of evidence of being lived in, and reaches a level of peace while looking around. Peace that is ruined by the evidence of a break-in and the enemy encounter, similarly to what happens to Daniel while he's at home. This was Daniel's home away from home, and it was destroyed in the same way. Something pretty neat about the story in Amnesia is that it has four potential endings, which I did mention previously, all basically available to account for the decision of the player, one where you ultimately decide to stop Alexander's plan and have him killed by the Shadow, then leave the castle and return home. That's the most popular ending. Then there's the ending with Agrippa's head, where you put that through the portal first and it causes Alexander to once again be consumed by the Shadow, and you are potentially spared by Vyar and Agrippa in the afterlife. The third option is to allow Alexander to leave through the portal and go home while you are consumed by the shadow. This is an unlikely choice for the player, since most don't want to die, but it is meant to be an option for those who see sympathy for Alexander and regret for Daniel's actions. The fourth and final option is the lesser known one. When you're imprisoned in the cell, Alexander asks you to wait for the shadow to consume you. The thing is that Christopher Odd, someone who I actually enjoyed watching playing Amnesia, he's very observant and logical with the notes and puzzles. He actually got confused with the cells, despite them having three different ways to exit, 
that he almost died to the shadow in what is essentially a secret ending. Like, the guy was really good at the game, I just find this hilarious. Like, I don't think anybody would have come that close to actually finding a secret ending by accident. I'm wondering if, like... Is there some way I gotta get rid of this organic tissue? Oh. Now, just two more things I want to mention is that, firstly, Frictional would sacrifice anything they think was useful or of good quality in aid of maintaining the vision they had for the game, and this included a lesser-known set of diaries from the character Hubert. They gave information about Hubert's experience with Daniel in Algeria. 17th May, 1839. Early afternoon. It has come to my attention that there's been an accident. Daniel, my research assistant, has been trapped inside the burial chamber. All men are ordered to lift the massive stone hinder. Recover Daniel after one hour of entrapment. After some preparation, the workers hoisted the heavy stone with block and tackle. Daniel is delirious, and his mind is slowly recovering. I've decided to have him leave for England. It would be foolish of me to risk not just his life, but the expedition's success by keeping him here. 20th May, 1839. Those imbeciles! How dare they sacrifice my expedition to their superstition! The camp is in chaos, and they blame the orb. They won't get their hands on it. I shot one of them to put them in their place. It can't be helped. They are animals, all of them. They killed four men in the most gruesome way. Their skinless bodies torn apart. They say the desert took them. But I know murder when I see it. I have sent Abdullah to contact the French in Algier. 22nd May, 1839. That thing is after me. It's been hunting me for days. But I keep out of its trail, so I will persevere. I can see a settlement at the edge of the desert. I'm getting closer. I can see it, but it is not me. It is Abdullah. Through his eyes I see, his mind I hear. Confined to myself, I see only death, dressed in the orb's darkest shadow. Herbert sounded like he would have been an interesting character to get to know, but trying to put him in the story as an active character when it's important that he's completely gone before Daniel wakes up in the castle does cause some complications and ultimately makes him obsolete. Finally, being a sort of alchemy-focused fantasy tale of other worlds, the story takes liberties in that regard and has moments of what can only be described as magic or absolute fantasy which we will cover later on, but one of the ones I really want to mention is the ridiculous contraption that prevents Daniel from reaching the Inner Sanctum and how it looks advanced even for modern times. Who's there? Oh, that's... yeah, wow, that's... that's normal. Perfectly reasonable technology for this time period. The torture chancel was an interesting level. It made a clear break from all the claustrophobic tunnels that make up the majority of our levels. It also presented a challenge since we had to fill that space with interesting pieces and still be able to run into an older computers. The idea of the level is to give the player a sense of what is to come, and to give him a feeling that maybe all this was here even before Alexander built his castle. As a contrast to the mystic shrines, we have an electric barrier in the back of the level. The idea and design of this bit is an homage to the movie Event Horizon. I watched Event Horizon, and honestly, I thought it was a pretty badass film, except for the bit where he goes into, like, the back of the black hole thing, and it's like... This whole thing is like motherboards. I mean... Why, like, why would, why would the walls be made of motherboards? If, if it was the future, we wouldn't just have the same motherboards, but more of them, like hundreds more. We would just have smaller and, and more efficient motherboards. But like, the the ceiling is is motherboards. The the walls, the floor, the floor is motherboard. He's walking on the motherboard. Stop you ruining it. I think they're referencing the black hole reactor thingy for inspiration, but I guess they just wanted to add some, you know, lightning in there. So that was sort of like a summary of the story and some little interesting things about Dark Descent. Let's move on to Soma. Simon, the man you control during the events of Soma, is hit by another car while driving in 2015. His friend does not survive the crash, and he does survive, however with severe brain damage. Less than a month later, Simon agreed to a brain scan from David Munchie, an up-and-coming engineer who's trying to create a system in which a computer can scan a model of your brain in its current state and convert it into code that the program would then correct. Munchie would then convert that code into a real-life method of solving the issue. Munchie then informs Simon that he simply needs to work on some simple cardio, 
and alter his diet with some simple medication. Despite Munchie's confidence, Simon dies shortly before his 27th birthday, more than likely due to the complications from his brain damage. Shortly before his death, Simon agreed to Munchie using his brain scan for future work. Some 45 years later, the Pathos 2 Deep Thermal Mining Station is created in the Atlantic Ocean, and Munchie's work is continued there as it becomes a research facility and houses the Omega Space Gun, an easy method of launching satellites. An artificial intelligence was used to oversee maintenance in Pathos 2, named the WOW, which stands for Warden Unit. It was stationed in Site Alpha, and its primary concern was the preservation of humanity. Soon after, Wolchek, under Johann Ross's persuasion, enabled the WOW to become the station-wide caretaker. At 5.13am on January 12, 2103, the impact event occurred. Referred to as the Apocalypse by many, the comet Telos collided with Earth, landing in the Pacific Ocean. The impact triggered firestorms in many areas on Earth, and additionally ejected enormous amounts of dust and debris into the atmosphere. The impact rendered the surface of the Earth completely barren, killing all surface-dwelling life. Much of the life under the sea continued to thrive, including the humans stationed at Pathos II. All communication with other stations is ceased, and Earth's surface is completely destroyed. Soon after, the WoW starts redefining its protocols, while maintaining life support and maintenance. Soon after, Carl Semkin repairs a heat shield burnout, and during his work from the pilot seat, he's very likely scammed by the WoW. He reported feeling nausea, and there were unusual levels of electromagnetism reported from the pilot seat. Soon after that, the structure gel starts to change. Lisa Cameron reports that the gel can operate without a power source for a time, and when it binds mechanical devices, it increases connectivity. These changes were brought on by the WOW, however, when the gel is used by something larger than small devices, it acts similarly to a cancer, eventually ruining the host it attempts to help. The WOW begins infecting many helper machines and uploading them with brain scans. This is in aid of furthering the human race, however, results in some very unstable creations filled with paranoia, anger, and fear which makes them extremely prone to violence and confusion. These machines are referred to as Mockingbirds. Soon after, Carl Semkin and Amy Azaro are asked with putting the Upsilon Station in a perpetual state of energy production for the entire site. They were tasked with sealing and securing the station as to avoid the WoW's reanimated machines from damaging anything. During this process, Semkin is attacked and killed by a Mockingbird. Azaro manages to electrocute the Mockingbird and makes it out of Upsilon. Azaro is injured and only manages to survive by being connected to the WoW, where Simon later discovers her. Catherine Chun discovers that the WoW has been making brain scans of all the members of Pathos 2. Catherine then works on the idea of launching everyone's brain scans into space on a virtual arc so that something can survive. Catherine begins scanning members of Pathos 2. Previous to his scan, Mark Sarang comments on how this must be the future of humanity and that we will live on through this continuity. Soon after his scan, Mark Sarang commits suicide on the pilot chair. As many as five other people commit suicide on or after being scanned in by the pilot seat and Catherine's project is put on hold. At Omicron, Paul Alansky notes that the structure gel remains unchanged on a fundamental level. The problem is not the gel, but its controller, the WOW. The gel has not taken on any new properties, the WOW simply uses it in ways we would never even have dreamed of. The ARC team makes it to Phi and discuss whether they will launch the ARC. The worry is that the ARC will not make it into space and it would be the destruction of the legacy of the human race. Catherine is determined to launch and it results in an accident that leads to her death. Akers requests to be moved to Theta, and so is picked up by Maggie and Sean, however, according to vague reports, Akers may have injected structure gel into Sean and he's bled out while Maggie died on the floor of the control room holding evidence of Akers' attack. Akers travels to Theta and the team discover him unconscious and punctured by structure gel. It is very likely he's been consuming it. Akers then begins causing havoc at the station and is believed to have killed several of Pathos 2 survivors. The remaining survivors die of deprivation of food and oxygen. In order to prevent the mockery of life that the WoW has created, Imogen Reed deactivates power to the WoW and shuts it down. The WoW then activates its backup power and seeks to continue its purpose in making and sustaining life. Three months later, the WoW manages to upload the 2015 Toronto brain scan of Simon Jarrett to a Cortex chip implanted into the deceased corpse of Imogen Reed, perhaps to reach a level of dramatic irony, considering the first significant thing Simon does is reactivate the power. Later, Simon has Catherine copy himself to another diving suit capable of withstanding the pressure of the Abyss. Simon then reaches the Tau Station and fires Sarah Lindwall, notably the last living human that we know of, defending the Ark and what remains of humanity. Her team seemed to succumb to deprivation. The story ends with the third iteration of Simon being left in the darkness, alone on Pathos 2, while Simon 4 lives on in the Ark with the future of mankind. Now, there's a hell of a lot more to say about the story in Soma, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. So what I will say is I'll see you next time for an in-depth look at Soma's story, a few details you may have missed, and a direct comparison with Amnesia to really figure out how best they were both used. Regardless, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Good luck. I have so many questions! What in the hell are you talking about?